everyone. It's going to be a fun day. I'm excited that you're going to be here with us. I got to talk to Doc Schmidt. Now, if you don't know Doc Schmidt, I'm going to tell you a little more about him in just a moment. But he is a GI fellow up in St. Louis at SLU right now. And he has some interesting and fun videos or TikToks that you may be aware of. He is doing his fellowship in gastroenterology. So we're going to take the opportunity to pick his brain, those little gray cells, and see what we can learn about the disease process on a couple of diagnoses that you may want more information about. Uh, so talking about uh, Doc Schmidt, if you have been on TikTok or Instagram and you follow medical uh, TikToks, he, I think I'll let him tell you, but I believe he, you started out on TikTok and then moved to Instagram and then you were doing YouTube stuff, but absolutely I am more on YouTube. So much fun. Uh, and he has quite the wig assortment, which reminds me, I have some wigs I've got to send you oh, that yeah. I have got for my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I got one wig that I thought, oh, I'm going to try, and that I put it on, and the children said I look like Dora the Explorer, so it's still in the bag. But um, this is how you can find. Tell us, uh, Doc Schmidt. Tell us a little bit about how you started out and how you got involved with social media, because you've been doing this since you were a teenager. It's true, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on here. But yeah, I've been uh, when I was a teenager, I made more kind of YouTube videos, and then I went the medical route in terms of my career. And then I started my fellowship, as you said, at St. Louis University back in uh, about a year ago at this point, last July. And I've always liked making videos, so I decided to start making some kind of fun, silly, but also educational healthcare-themed videos based on different experiences that I'd had in the past or, or that I was having currently as well. So I started out on TikTok in October of uh, 2020, so coming up on a year for that. And then I got some pretty great success, which I was very fortunate to have. And then that kind of led to me moving to Instagram to kind of find a new audience and then ultimately moving over to YouTube to finding a, a newer audience still. And congratulations. I saw that you crested over a hundred thousand subscribers, which uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know all the dynamics of making a career out of YouTube, but that's, that's a big point, right? That's a big thing. Yeah, no, it's very exciting for me, especially as someone like I, I kind of came of age when YouTube was becoming a thing. I was like in high school when YouTube first came out. So I was one of that first generation that was like trying to make it big on YouTube. So it's very <laughs> cool. But they, I think they haven't done it yet, but I think they send you like a little plaque. When you I was just going to say, I think you get a plaque. I've seen some people that I follow uh, up. up you know, we used to look at magazines and stuff. And now when we want to be out there or distracting our brain we jump onto youtube and then you get little people that you follow and i tend to follow medical people but not all the time i've got a gymnast that i follow and some obscure things that but uh they they get very excited about subscribers mm -hmm. and likes i do know that and uh, cco has a youtube channel medical coding cert so if you guys aren't already on there make sure that you jump out and say hello and do the same for doc schmidt and there is his information uh, of course all you have to do is put in Doc Schmidt on any of these platforms and I'm sure that he will come up. Uh, the ones that I, YouTubes that I have seen were, uh, yes, you have some very good educational ones, but you have a lot of very funny ones. And I have to say that I will watch one and I'll think to myself, absolutely I have seen that or absolutely I've seen a patient say that and uh, because you're taking them from life experience mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> or I know a doctor like that uh, yeah absolutely and which has led me into a couple other providers that do this on the side and it's been a lot of fun to to watch them and have that aha moment well we have some great education for you uh, Doc Schmidt has told me that he is not as familiar with the coding aspect and that is because med students, uh, uh, residents, when they get in the fellowship, especially teaching hospital, they don't deal with this side of medicine. 
when they get out into the, well, encoding when you're no longer being educated, we call it the real world is our little catchphrase. Uh, then they do. Now, one of my dreams is to get into medical school to and start teaching our future providers about the code set so they're not you know, hit up on the side of the head with a brick and a pillowcase when they get out there. It's like, what do you mean I won't make any money if I don't know the codes? Uh, or they have to hire somebody to do everything for them, uh, which is also a good thing too. But anyway, he's going to talk about the disease process. And then I have just put some of the codes to highlight for you to give you a reference. The first thing I wanted to talk about, which is a big gastroenterology area, and I think extremely common, is GERD versus reflex. Now, I think of it as the same thing, but there is some nuances, aren't there, that make these different? Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, reflex and GERD are sort of like synonyms in layman's terms in the sense of when we ask patients about it, like, do you have reflux? Do you have GERD? Do you have heartburn? But kind of in this table that you've laid out, it gets at sort of the, the distinctions here because often we use the term reflux to refer to reflux esophagitis. Right. Well. Different code. <laughs> exactly. I can, I can imagine. So they can all have similar symptoms, these three things, esophagitis, GERD, um, Barrett's, and these symptoms can be kind of the classic signs of heartburn, like, you know, burning your throat, a little bit of chest discomfort, um, actually feeling like acid is coming back up. That's a common way that we explain it. GERD refers to gastroesophageal reflux disease. So that's like the scientific medical terminology of, of defining it, but you can use it colloquially in terms of talking to the patient to say reflux, but kind of getting into the distinction. So esophagitis, um, the itis at the end, as you might know, refers to inflammation. So you can have GERD without having esophagitis because GERD is a very symptomatic um, distinction, whereas esophagitis is much more of an actual visual or pathologic distinction where we're going in with a scope, we're looking at the esophagus and we're saying, oh yes, it looks red, it looks inflamed. Um, the other way you can diagnose esophagitis is by taking samples of an esophagus that looks inflamed, like when you're doing a scope looking down there. And the pathologist will be looking at the slides uh, or looking at the samples rather and making slides and saying, yes, there's inflammatory cells there. You have esophagitis. Um, and then kind of taking it a step further, Barrett's esophagus is again, kind of a combined um, diagnostic effort in that we have to be looking at the um, at the esophagus directly with our scopes, with our procedures. And then we also need to take samples of, um, of the tissue there and have the pathologist take a look and confirm for us that there's abnormal cells that are starting to change because of how much acid has hit those cells to start causing it. So it's a, a precancerous condition, Barrett's esophagus is. I had read, and the way I had explained Barrett's in the past, and let me know if I'm doing this accurately, is that, uh, you know, you can have esophagitis, you can have uh, GERD, and that ultimately what could happen is that Barrett's is a change in the cellular structure where the lining of the stomach is starting, the tissue for the stomach starts going up and growing into that esophagus so that is that what they're looking for to see if that's like stomach lining tissue that gets up into the esophagus exactly because okay. what happens is you have because it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it the stomach has a certain type of cell because there's so much acid in the stomach right you need to those cells that are down there need to be able to withstand all of this acid because they're constantly sitting in this kind of bath of acid every time you digest something mm -hmm. but over time if you're having so much acid come into your esophagus Normally, there shouldn't be any acid in your esophagus. Your food goes down, it goes into the stomach, and then all the acid stays there. But if you keep having your acid reflux or come back up into the esophagus and hit those cells, they're going to start getting damaged. And over time, your body, it's, it's kind of, in some ways, it's cool that your body can do this. Your body protects itself by changing those cells into something that can withstand that acid. The problem is whenever your body's trying to quickly uh, change your cells, that's kind of a, a recipe for, for developing the cancer. That's it. Yeah, that, that is like you said, I was thinking the exact same thing is like, yeah, it's really cool how the body adapts. But the problem is when you have cells that change that stop doing what they're, they were created to do. That's just a, a flag for hey, we're mutating. And once you start mutating on the cellular level, uh, they learn to grow abnormally, as we know, you know, cancer is 
uh, cells that don't do what they're designed to do. And so it is pretty, it, I think that's pretty exciting. When a person comes in, is there a time frame or a rhyme or reason to uh, going from having esophagitis and having irritation from maybe uh, taking medication or eating something or maybe you're predisposed uh, 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 I'm not sure how much that has a, a part of it but that a lot of times I think it could be you know medications and stuff bad habits that obesity uh, mm. absolutely you know uh, causes problems but you go from uh, esophagitis and then having something that's like GERD that tends to be a little more long-lasting chronic to getting to bear esophagus. Is there like a time frame or, or is it, uh, it's probably different for every person, but what do you kind of look for for that standard from where you go from one point that you don't treat it or you don't get on top of it that you end up in a place like Barrett's? Well, what can be challenging a lot of times, and you kind of alluded to this, the net result is everybody is a little bit different, but what can be challenging is that your symptoms don't necessarily correlate to your risk of having Barrett's. What I mean by that is someone can come in and say, yeah, I have a little bit of heartburn. It's, you know, three to four times a week. I take a medicine for it. It works pretty well. But for whatever reason, let's say me as the GI doctor, I say, well, let's take a look at your throat and make sure there's nothing going on. And we might see um, esophagitis, and we might see signs consistent with Barrett's. We take samples, send it to the lab, and it is Barrett's. There might be a similar patient who, or let's say there's another patient who comes in and they're like, oh, I, I have reflux with every meal I eat. I'm at the high, taking the highest dose of medicines for heartburn, and nothing helps. And I'm like, well, we definitely need to take a look to make sure there's nothing concerning going on. We take a look, we go down, they don't have any Barrett's. So it can be a very broad thing, and we can't just use symptoms to diagnose it. And that's why we have to use a little bit of um, kind of intuition and some guidelines to do that. Um, there's not necessarily a timeline though to answer kind of that question. It's not like okay. if you have GERD for six months, you're going to develop Barrett's or something like that. There's right. no time. And there's other things like the H. pylori that plays part and stuff. That's another whole topic. I know yeah. <laughs> you get into some of that other stuff. Uh, so let's talk about, we, we've, more or less talked about the signs and symptoms, right? And I think most people know the signs and symptoms of esophagitis and, and GERD because everybody gets heartburn probably at some time. Uh, so we could probably skip that. Diagnostically, uh, uh, going in and visually seeing, you can't treat something if you can't see it. So uh, what what would make you what would be key words that you would hear the patient say or responses from your questions that would say, yeah, we need to go scope you? Yeah, that's a good question. There, there's a few different things. The, the big overarching thing is something called alarm symptoms. And that's a common theme in medicine, not just in GI that can be used, you know, in cardiology and in uh, pulmonology too, where it's you, certain symptoms tell me that there's something concerning potentially going on and we need to investigate further. So in the context of GI and more specifically in kind of the heartburn realm, um, if you're having weight loss, for example, if you're over 50, if you have late onset of your symptoms, so let's say you're 50 years old, you've never had heartburn before, and then suddenly you have the worst heartburn you've ever had. Um, uh -huh. another thing I was concerning. Or similarly, let's say you took a Tums once or twice a week your whole life, and then suddenly you're needing the highest dose of the strongest acid. Oh, age 50. So okay. like an acute change, um, an acute worsening things, um, Nighttime symptoms are a common alarm symptom. So meaning like you'll wake up from being asleep and you have such severe heartburn. Obviously that happens sometimes. So I don't want to scare people out there who are, <laughs> yeah. like that. it doesn't mean that you need to run to the emergency room right away. But these are things that with kind of putting the whole clinical picture together can make us a little bit more concerned that we need to take a look. And, are, go ahead. I was going to say, that's what you look for too is lines, right? I'm always, I'm really big on lines and i like where that comment that you made about uh what'd you call it alarming alarm symptoms alarm symptoms i hadn't heard that before so where you take this statement that the patient makes and then you you can you know correlate uh, some patients are very melodramatic i know um and some patients are could be on their deathbed and you go in and ask them how they're doing that day and they're like Oh, well, pretty good, you know. <laughs> and yeah. So you you have to build that relationship with your patient to to see what you know uh, that that is 
with all diagnoses that you come up with, but I like that, that you stated that. Uh, let me jump real quick to the treatments because this is something that I've had. I, I got this when I had um, gotten obese and, and then I got into that morbid obesity realm and then developed, you know, like the hiatal hernia that, you know, and then um, uh, I, they had scoped me and, and everything. And, and ultimately I think it was the obesity that caused it. So I went, back then on Prevacet and I took it for a year but actually what I had done is I had been eating ibuprofen like candy because mm. my back hurt and ibuprofen will wreck those tissues mm. <laughs> so don't do that guys and I had burnt a little hole in my esophagus mm. off on the side I mean it felt like a heart attack and uh, I was working in medical records one time, and I remember it hurt so bad that I broke out in a sweat and all the signs and symptoms. I mean, it was radiating down my arm. And finally, my supervisor said, you know what, we're just going to walk up to the ER. Yeah. And it didn't take long for that ER doc to, to, you know, say, you know, I think you have, you know, esophagitis or whatever. And sure enough. And so I took Prevacid for a year and healed that up. And now even though everything else is taken care of, I eat something and it's like, uh, but then I had a, a kidney issue, so I take HCTZ, which means I had to take uh, uh, potassium. Mm -hmm. Well, they told you, take the potassium with something on your stomach, but I didn't mm -hmm. because I'm not a good patient. <laughs> well, potassium will do the same thing. And so even now, which talk about these alarming symptoms, I'll wake up choking on acid if you've ever had acid get up in your nose mm -hmm. not a good thing <laughs> mm -hmm. burns and then i'll remember oh wait the last couple of days i've taken my medicine on an empty stomach anyway uh those alarming things but i can do previous now i told you this whole story to get to treatments and saying previous works for me but prilosec doesn't and there's uh, the one that is the the purple nexium didn't do that and not a pleasant thing to tell you but when I would take Nexium everything I would eat would just pass through me I don't know that that you know uh, so it kind of explain what some of these which are now over the counter they weren't mm -hmm. back in the day uh, what the difference is in say Nexium, Prilosec, Prevacid, Tums uh, that that people would get to treat basic heartburn Sure, absolutely. Yeah, there, there are kind of, I would say, three classes of types of medicine. So there's like the Tums type medicine or like the Pepto-Bismol. That's more of like a Band-Aid type medicine that can help with a lot of things. It can help with stomach upset. It can help with heartburn. Then there's the stronger class that's called uh, H2 blockers. The most famous one of those, well, I, I don't know which the most famous one is, but Pepsid or Famotidine, oh. the over-the-counter one. Ranitidine before it got uh, taken off the shelves, if you're familiar with that, is also an H2 blocker. Those, were, those are the first ones that work directly with acid release um, to decrease symptoms of heartburn. But then we got the much stronger, much more successful PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. And that's what those uh, types you were alluding to, the Prevacid, the uh, Nexium, Protonix is another one. Oh, as yeah. well. They all end, the generics of them all end in like Azole. So it's like Omeprazole, Pantoprazole, Lansoprazole, Esomeprazole. We, we teach, we have a, we have a, uh pharmacology course too so that's one of the things that i've told them. always pay attention to those endings of the medications and it'll tell you where to place them oh exactly yeah if you go by the generics it's very much easier to keep track of what mm -hmm. different medicines do um, but those are kind of the the main medicines and this kind of going back to this table here a little bit we can kind of i can kind of address like how you would use them to treat so if someone has GERD which is like i said is mainly diagnosed based on symptoms so let's say you come in you're like yeah i have heartburn three times a week, it's really annoying, but that's my only symptom. I don't have weight loss. I, you know, I'm not vomiting, things like that. Then I might just start you on a uh, kind of the middle road one. I might just start you on Pepsid and say, how you do on this? If someone has severe enough symptoms that they aren't being helped by Pepsid, then kind of the next step up would be these PPIs. And that would be like the Nexium, the uh, Prevacid, for example. And this is a good way to kind of segue into kind of what you were asking before, like when do you scope? Another reason that I would take a look and see if they have esophagitis or if they have Barrett's is let's say we, 
based on your symptoms alone, I put you on the stronger meds that we have, and that's the PPIs. And despite that, you're not getting any better. We are on it twice a day. You're on the highest dose. You're not getting any better. That tells me I need to at least take a look to look at your throat and make sure there's nothing else going on. And that's where I could diagnose um, esophagitis or Barrett's. And then if we have those diagnoses, then the treatment changes further still. So if esophagitis, I don't think this functions into billing as much, but it's more of a like a doctor distinction when we're um, communicating it. There's degrees of esophagitis. There's A, B, C, and D. And that specifically relates to the severity of it. And if someone has um, B, C, or D, they need to definitely be on twice a day high dose PPI, but it's actually recommended that they, after they're on that medication for X amount of time, usually two to three months, they need to come back and get another scope so we can see evidence of improvement. Um, and that, that can be a very important thing because we want to see, sometimes you, you can have such an inflamed esophagus, such severe esophagitis, that we actually can't tell that you have Barrett's because the inflammation is so severe. So it's like a two-step process. We say, oh, you have really bad esophagitis. We need to get you on our strongest medications, the PPIs, the Nexiums, um, twice a day for usually I do two to three months. And then I have them come back. Usually that esophagitis has cleared up, but Barrett's doesn't get treated that easy. So if the inflammation, the esophagitis is now improved, I can now see better and I can see if we have signs of Barrett's and take a sample and our, our lab will be able to help diagnose that. That was going to lead me to the next question. So once you get to that point or a person has Barrett's, how do they treat that? So what Barrett's is, it, it, that's kind of a really exciting kind of new developing thing now, because before what it would be is you, you continue on an acid suppressant, obviously, but that's once the damage is done, an acid suppressant usually is not quite enough to um, reverse it, so to speak. You can, you can potentially stop, like slow it. So it's like you stay at this level, but Barrett's progresses. The idea is this notion of dysplasia, which is abnormal cells. Right. And that develops when the body is trying to replicate cells or change cells as much as possible. And you can get low grade dysplasia, high grade dysplasia, and then cancer, essentially esophageal cancer is what these cells can look like under the microscope. So what we're looking at is initially, if you just have Barrett's and you don't have any dysplasia, you just have the esophagus cells have turned into the stomach cells, but they don't look abnormal in any other way. That's something we just monitor. We keep you on an acid suppressant and we monitor you. But the reason we're monitoring you is because there's a good chance, or there is a chance, I should say, not a good chance. It's on the scale of uh, 1% or less that you can progress and go right. from that cell and start to have dysplasia, which is like abnormal looking cells, not just the wrong type, but they're not even normal for stomach cells anymore or esophagus cells. And then at that point, we can actually do what's called an ablation, where we can go oh. in with the esophagus and we can burn this area of abnormal cells, um, which is a pretty cool thing that we can do. And then if, if it's more severe, like either that doesn't work, we just don't catch it in that amount of time. If it gets severe enough, there's actually a more advanced GI procedure where they can actually, through the scope, so it's not a true surgery, they can cut out those abnormal cells of the very okay. technique. And then unfortunately, if we either, if either that doesn't work or we don't um, check the patient soon enough and they develop full esophageal cancer, if it's big enough, then the only solution is actual surgery and, and potentially chemotherapy to actually treat that. That, that was going to be my next question is if the cancer has developed and they go in and they resect that, they just take that out. What then um, do they just attach the esophagus again to the, um, um, mm -hmm. that's not the duodenum up there. Is it duodenum at the top of the bottom? bottom it would be like the stem essentially yeah, stem, yeah. Uh, right there so you could because people do that with uh different types of gastro bypass right so do you just cut that off and then reattach it in a different portion of the stomach or yeah i mean essentially of course it's again kind of a decision by like decision patient by patient decision but right. um, depending on how much is gone they can take out a portion of the esophagus and just either connect esophagus to esophagus if there was like a middle part of the esophagus that was the cancer or if the cancer was really close to the stomach they might have to just attach the esophagus to like, I guess right. you could say a different part of the stomach, so to speak. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. A lot of people don't realize you can live without your stomach. Uh, it's the intestines that, you, <laughs> that gets where people get the nutrition and, and everything. That's uh, because ultimately that's what I chose to do is have sleep and um, lost 150 pounds. Well, I'll talk about that sometime. That's but uh, and and the, the uh, I knew that they had said if you have bypass that you don't get heartburn anymore. But if you get sleeve, eh, that you'd still have the, that problems. So let's move on to our next topic because I could 
come up with reasons to talk to you about this. The takeaway, though, is uh, for our listeners is that each of these are distinct diagnoses and they have signs and symptoms that alert uh, uh, symptoms that that uh, Dr. Schmidt alluded to, that's something you want to look in documentation when your provider uh, does that because that'll help you. You're always thinking uh, what is the thought process for your provider so that you make sure that you're translating accurately. And if you do risk adjustment, you're looking at a year's worth of documentation. So we're saying, okay, at the first of the year, they started out with this uh, esophagitis, then it developed into GERD. And, you know, by the end of the year, hey, these, uh, these signs and symptoms are we looking at something like Barrett's esophagus, which does risk adjust and uh, GERD does too with an RXHCC, another, you know, but knowing the treatments and being able to draw that line. And uh, so very good. I, that was a lot of fun to talk about. Now we're going to move on to our next topic. And we're going to talk about first acute hepatitis, and then we're going to move into chronic hepatitis. Now, there is, you could talk all day, I think, on hepatitis, but it is something that, now in your world, it's probably very, very common, but for for us, it's not as common. It's not, we don't see patients with hepatitis coming through our desks as often. Now, if you're working with you know, Doc Schmidt and his, their team, of course, that is something that people would be coming to them to see. So let's talk about hepatitis and the acute and what the difference is, is in A, B, C, and E. And isn't C, I just watched your video the other day that hepatitis C, they just discovered that like in the 80s, right? Isn't that yeah. what you said? Yeah, hepatitis I mean, that was a big deal. Yeah, it used to be called, uh, I believe it was called like not A, not B until they. Uh, got yeah. <laughs> well, I was uh, coding in, the, well, not really coding, coding in the 80s, but I was still doing medical stuff. But yeah, the uh, that's, I won't get into that because then I'll go off on a tangent. I'm really bad about that. So <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's talk about first A, hepatitis A. Now, notice guys that when you look at the code set, they're always going to want to know is, it, it uh, for all of these, does the patient have hepatic coma or with or without? And they're not going to be at the GPs if they're with, okay? <laughs> Just so you know, they're going to be inpatient. We, we deal, some coders are um, outpatient coders and some patient or inpatient coders. So we're going to be talking about those together. But just so you know, the code set, we have to define whether it's with or without. So what about hepatitis A? What can you tell us? And, and yeah, before I even get into that, that's a great point. I, that's what I was going to lead <laughs> off with is that hepatic coma, it's not, there's no ambiguity to it. If someone's in clinic, they don't have an hepatic coma. So no. you can <laughs> eliminate that. The, uh, other well, one that, the other one that I like is um, AAAs, aortic aneurysms. And the code set says with or without rupture. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay, well, they're not going to be in the doctor's office if they've ruptured. But anyway, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, so these, uh, these hepatitis um, diseases are all referring to different types of viral hepatitis. Hepatitis, again, we see the itis, like I was talking about with esophagitis. The itis just means inflammation. And hep refers to the liver. So like the study of the liver is hepatology, um, for example. And then these viruses are all ones that specifically attack the liver. So there's hepatitis A, B, C. There is a hepatitis D, uh, which is actually what the delta agent is referring to in, okay. in the hep B distinction. And then there's uh, C and E. So A is one that's kind of a little bit different than the others and, and easier to keep straight in that you'll kind of see on the next slide when we get to it, there isn't really a chronic hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is specifically an acute infection. You often get it from contaminated food. Um, so it's commonly like there's outbreaks of hepatitis A from like restaurants of people not washing their hands, for example. Um, if you have to get a hepatitis, I would say hepatitis A is probably the best one to get in that it's yeah. short-lived. Uh, you don't, there's not really treatments for hepatitis A. There's a vaccine, but there's, once you have hepatitis A, it's more of supportive care to just try to get you through it. And most people do okay with that. Obviously you can see that since there's a code for it, not everyone does okay. Cause you can develop a hepatic coma from it. Right. And that is um, just in general, hepatic coma is a 
going into a coma from liver failure. What your liver does a million different things, and one of those key things is it detoxifies your blood. And if the liver is not working from any number of things, but in this case from hepatitis A, it can uh, cause a buildup of ammonia in your blood, and that causes you to slowly become more and more confused. As the ammonia builds up enough, though, it'll make you go completely unconscious. That's oh. that. Just- and hepatitis B. Mm-hmm. So hepatitis B is a much trickier one. It's very different than hepatitis A. Hepatitis B is a DNA uh, virus as opposed to oh, wow. an RNA virus. And it can actually, or it does actually kind of get into your DNA. So it's not, you can't, it, it's very hard to completely cure hepatitis B um, mm-hmm. because it kind of gets into your the DNA of your liver cells. And it often sits, it's much more of a kind of dormant virus that kind of hangs out. It can cause low level inflammation. Um, and it's more likely to develop into a chronic infection, which I know we'll get to a little bit later. This distinction in these codes, like the 16.1 versus 16.9 of the Delta agent is referring to what's also known as hepatitis D, D as in dog, because hepatitis D as in dog is a unique entity in that it can't, you can't just have hepatitis D as in dog. You have to get it with um, hepatitis B. They, they like go together, if that makes sense. So that's okay. why there's hepatitis that's why the code set is explained that way. Okay, I didn't know that, and that would make sense because I don't even pay attention to the with or without. I mean, because it, the provider states what it is, so I didn't think about what it what it was. Uh, very interesting. Now, when you say it gets into the DNA, can a person be born with Hep B? You can if you're um, getting if your parent if your mother has hepatitis B. That's definitely one possibility. So that would be considered a. Um, I mean, when you're born with something, uh, I'd have to look to see if there was a code for that because we have a whole list of codes for, you know, um, um, being, uh, what, what's the word I'm thinking of? Like a so, pre-existing? Or no, no. When you're born with something, genetic. Uh, congenital. <laughs> <laughs> That's like when you wake up in the morning, and you think, how do you spell the, it's like you say it every day, but is it THU just doesn't sound right. Um, <laughs> hepatitis C. Now I, I kind of think, is this more common or not? C, now, thankfully it's becoming less common because we have a way okay. hepatitis C is something that we can treat and cure. Hepatitis C is a uh, RNA virus. So it's a little bit easier to take care of. This is the one that we knew about the latest, which is why it's C. We've just been naming these as we, right. uh, I guess, E came after, but of A and B, it's it's the later one. And we've been able to develop effective treatments for it. You might see commercials for them pretty frequently. There's a lot yeah. of different um, types of these treatments, antivirals that you can take. Usually it's on an eight to 12 week course. And then in, in many, many cases, we're able to, to cure it. Hepatitis C um, is often dormant, or not dormant, that's not the right word, but you often aren't really affected by it when you first get infected with it. So acute hepatitis C, I would say is relatively rare in the sense that it's, it's not uncommon that we wouldn't know you have it like, because right. it's, 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 it doesn't cause that many symptoms until it starts to develop into a chronic infection and cause more and more inflammation. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. Do any of these, uh, and I'm always, everybody's used to me bringing in my family members and things that they have. I mean, I'm always talking about them. Uh, but, you know, my brother-in-law, he, uh, he, he passed, but he had, cirrhosis of the liver and then he got cancer but he when we brought him home on hospice and was taking care of him he had hepatitis and it how many of these are something that you can get because of another disease process yeah and that's what is it because i mean not necessarily they're exposed per se or that that maybe like like other things like um um you know, that you, you just have them kind of in your system anyway, but then when, when you get a condition like cancer or cirrhosis or something, then it shows up and flares up and, and stuff. But, um, uh, is that. So, so virus, so hepatitis, what can be confusing is that hepatitis does not imply a viral infection in and of itself. Hepatitis That's... is just an inflammation of the liver and okay. that can happen from alcohol. That can happen from, uh, obesity, right. honestly, That's non-alcoholic, uh, right. You know, hepatitis. Um, and then you can get that from autoimmune problems. There's an entity called autoimmune hepatitis, for example. So if someone has cirrhosis, which is like liver failure, significant right. kind of end-stage liver disease, 
that's not necessarily from a viral hepatitis, like one of these on the slide. It's not necessarily from A, B, C, or E, but what it is most likely from is some sort of hepatitis that's causing inflammation over a long period of time, be that from alcohol, be that from an autoimmune disease. So I wouldn't say there can be people, like if someone is drinking alcohol in excess and also has hepatitis B, then they're a lot like more likely to develop liver failure um, or liver cirrhosis, I should say. But it's not necessarily what you were describing. Like if someone just drinks all their life, they're not like at risk to get hepatitis B because their liver is weak, if that makes sense. Right. So anytime the liver is being compromised, your, 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 the possibility of developing one of these is, is there just because the liver's compromised. So the, I guess the, the key distinction, the, the title for this slide might be more accurately acute viral hepatitis. That's what uh, these diagnoses are all referring to. But acute yeah. hepatitis can happen from things that aren't viruses. Okay. Uh, the viruses are kind of na- not named, not in the best way, because it, right. it makes it sound like that if you have, because I've had that happen before where I tell people they have hepatitis from the alcohol that they're drinking. Like there's a diagnosis called alcoholic hepatitis. Right. There's and they no think that. that they have like hep C because of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. The only time they've heard hepatitis is in the context of these viruses, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. But that's a completely different thing. All that means is that your liver is inflamed. And in these, for these diagnoses here, it's saying your liver is inflamed because of these viruses that you're infected with, A, B, C, or E. Very good distinction. I think that's the key. That's Let's look at chronic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, one thing I want to make a distinction for our listeners is you'll notice that we have two different areas in the code set the coders when we're teaching them you know uh b anything that starts with the b in the diagnosis code means that it's some type of a bug or a germ or you know so uh if a person has a virus if they have an infection it, you know if they've got streptococcal or any of those MRSA all that's a b code a and b codes k codes have to do with the digestive system and so i always tell people think of special k cereal supposed to make your you know you healthy that and notice that we have you know chronic persistent hepatitis in the K's, but we have chronic viral hepatitis in the B's. So there's two, that distinct, that tells you the disease processes are two different areas, kind of like what you were just saying. So what, first let's start before you get into explaining this, let's start with how do you give that distinction between acute and chronic? Yeah, that, that can be honestly challenging at times. A, a big part of it uh, is time. So that's kind of a, a general thing in medicine overall. Acute is just came on and chronic is right. sometimes bad. So in the case of hepatitis B, for example, one of the criteria is that you've, you know, you've had this for six months if, you, if it's been going on for that amount of time. That's not enough always in and of itself. And we don't always know how long you've had hepatitis either, as you, as you might imagine. We don't know if you got it from a tattoo that you got last week, or we don't know if your mom maybe had hepatitis B and and passed it to you when you were a child. Um, But there are other, in the case of hepatitis B, at least there are uh, specific lab tests that we can do. Hepatitis B is a nightmare for any medical student uh, because there's this very intricate set, which I won't get too much into, but essentially there's a lot of different lab tests. When you're testing someone for hepatitis B, you don't just do one test and it says yes or no, they have it. Because it's such a complicated virus, and because like I said, it kind of hangs out in your DNA, um, there's a lot of different antibodies that your body makes in response to it. It's not just one or the other. Like with COVID, it's like you have the COVID antibody, you had COVID before. Right. But with hepatitis B, there's like four different antibodies that you could or could not have. And whichever ones are positive at one given time tell you, uh, give you an idea of the phase of the chronicity of it and it can help you diagnose that. And then the other element, which gets into this first distinction that you have is pathologically, we can uh, diagnose that way. So if someone has had a liver biopsy where we actually took a sample of their liver, um, findings that we have on there can tell us, um, the pathologist can help tell us if it's been going on for a long time, this inflammation, this hepatitis, or shorter. And that's why this top distinction, you know, I think that was really helpful to clarify this, this K group. Um, that's, again, for any type of hepatitis. So you can have chronic alcoholic hepatitis. You can have chronic uh, autoimmune hepatitis. And that will be mainly, a, that distinction is mainly a pathologic distinction where the uh, they're looking at the sample and looking at the entities like lobby like chronic lobular versus chronic active those are exclusively 
pathologic distinction. So that's not something that I honestly know too much about because I'm not the one that's actually making that individual distinction. Right. That's that because that's what I was going to ask you more uh, about that, because when I you pronounce it lobular and I look at it and think lobular. So I think it's the well, I'm always pronouncing things wrong. Uh, (laughs) But uh, is that my question was going to be, is that the different lobes of the 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 Mm. liver or Mm. is it mean something completely different? Like the lobes of the lung? Where you have, you know, because that's all divided up. We have a code for every different lobe of the lung having pneumonia. Is, sure. is this the same term as lobular as, because some people don't realize the liver is divided into mm-hmm. lobes. Yeah, the liver has its, its sections. And I guess this gets at why we're pronouncing it differently, because no, I'm not referring yeah. to lobes of the liver. It's lobule, liver is made up of lobules. Um, that's okay, kind of the good. Like good. Topic element of the liver. So you can see inflammation at kind of this. Uh, level and that's why you, your little note over here to the side where you say the lobular yeah. refers to benign uh, with lobular inflammation. So that's inflammation at the microscopic okay. level. The lobule isn't something you can see. Like if you took someone's liver out, you could see the lobe distinctions a little bit, but the lobules that's at a microscopic level. Well, I wondered, and when you pronounced it differently than I was thinking of it, and I thought, oh, ding, 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 learning mm-hmm. point for me. Very good. Now mm-hmm. with the so we've more or less talked about this previously the the term chronic is it it can still be the same uh, issues from the previous slide acute and then as we know acute is sudden onset chronic is over a period of time but uh, and I think you said when does it become chronic there's not necessarily a time frame that states up six months now you're chronic is does it have to do with the ability to treat it or is it is there like a protocol or a standard that says no we've gone from acute to chronic or this person just starts out with a diagnosis of chronic it, it's a little bit of a combination of things I, time okay. definitely plays into this more than kind of like i was saying with the GERD esophagitis distinction time right. can't really play in at all but in this one like if someone has hepatitis b for more than six months we, we do distinguish it as a chronic infection Mm-hmm. Um, but then we have the ability to also have these labs to help us. Cause like I was saying, you don't always know if someone's had it for six months or not. Right. Um, and then the other element, like with hepatitis C, hepatitis C is much simpler in how you diagnose it in the sense that it is more like, like you just do a test and it's like, yes, you have it or yes, you don't. Um, so hepatitis C, it's, it's more a time that we have to rely on. But then the other element of it, and this is what I was hinting at a little bit with when you brought up cirrhosis, um, sometimes, unfortunately we're diagnosing hepatitis C just based on the fact that you have cirrhosis so we're like, why do you have cirrhosis? And we do a bunch of tests and we find hepatitis okay. C. So if, if you have cirrhosis from hepatitis C, it's automatically chronic because it takes so long to develop cirrhosis. That's just the nature Makes of how it works. So you can't get cirrhosis from acute hepatitis C. It just tells us you've had it for months and months if you've already developed this uh, chronic liver inflammation of cirrhosis. And cirrhosis is another whole study. Uh, uh, pretty fascinating. Okay. Wrapping up the hepatitis, mm-hmm. when people think or hear hepatitis, they automatically think of attracting it, you know, getting it from somebody. Is Are these contagious? And if they are, how would you get it from one person to the other? So like my uh, brother-in-law, we were actively helping him with hospice and everything. And they assured us, no, we don't need to get tested and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 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 but just the ignorance of the family of, of the disease process, you know, everybody was saying, oh, okay, do, you know, is that something that's concerning for us? And they said no. So how would you explain the ability to uh, pass these from one person to another? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's fortunately not a, something you can get just by standing next to somebody. It's not like through respiratory droplets, like COVID, for example, it's in B and C it's, it's mainly through blood contact, infected blood contact. So, um, IV drug use, sharing needles with somebody. Um, if you uh, got a transfusion with someone who had infected blood, obviously now that's essentially unheard of, but that was, ha- that right. could happen more significantly like in the eighties, if you had a blood transfusion, um, that would be something that would be possible. Um, if you, you can get it from a parent, like at birth, um, there's some level of sexual transmission for both of them. Uh, hepatitis C, it's much more commonly if it's, uh, uh, men who have sex with men are like anal sex right. can be much more common to pass. Hepatitis B has elements of that as well. Um, and then the 
Uh, a, like I alluded to a little bit, is, is what we call fecal oral contact. So that's where you actually shed the virus in your stool. And so if you get, if, you know, the way that there's a lot of ways that can happen, I guess. Right. But if you contact someone else's stool particles, you can get their hepatitis A. Right. Um, and E works similarly to A. A and E, I just kind of remember because they're the first and the last. They're very the similar. Last. <laughs> there's got to be, there. there's always, I know, medical school, but when you have all of this information that you have to learn, you learn very quickly how to categorize and find little ways to, <laughs> that's why I always come up with something for every letter of the alphabet has a code set category, you know, so you come up with something cute to, to help you with that. Uh, so we are, we've covered a lot. There is so many more things that it involves gastroenterology. These are two areas that I thought, one, the GERD, very, very common. We see that. I mean, it's just so common uh, to, to see come across our desk. Hepatitis, not so much. So I wanted to highlight that because we needed to be educated uh, with that. But again, just a really fascinating area. And I did see your video on why you chose GI, and that was really good. This is a good opportunity to open up four questions with our people are, that are here. But I also wanted to let you know that if you make a point to jump over to Doc Smith's YouTube channel for sure, because he does lots of funny videos, uh, which <laughs> I really enjoy. But he also has educational ones. Now, of course, the educational aspect, I'm sure that doesn't get as many likes and subscribes and stuff, but they're brilliant the way that it's divided up. And so many things that are pertinent, I shared a couple actually on my LinkedIn, which I'm told is quite massive. I've uh, accumulated, I don't know how many people, but it's uh, supposedly a very impressive number on LinkedIn. And um, I'm just not real savvy with that that world. Uh, but the educational, all of this is you, if, if you can learn the disease process, the coding aspect just falls into place because that's what the code set does. It follows the disease process. The guidelines that you have to learn follow that. There is a specific specialty uh, credential if you choose to, to get into gastroenterology. Uh, and I think, didn't you? You mentioned because I sent him a a bunch of procedures, and he said, "Oh, some of these are little IR interventional radiology," and which again that that crosses right uh, in medicine. So, as we bef while we're getting some giving them time to think about questions, what made you decide to go in uh, into gastroenterology because? A lot of people don't realize that when you're in med school and then you get into your residency and stuff, they put you in everything, right? They they let you, they get exposed to everything. And uh, I think there's another uh, doctor, Glocken Smacker or whatever. I can't think of how you say it. It was like a really funny German name. But he has little videos on, you know, first day in uh, each practice like GI and surgery and what made you pick GI out of everything that you could have gone into right. well, let me tell you something I checked I keep track of the highest paid for specialties you know and it moves it used to be oncology cardiology and uh, I can't remember plastics always get in there but mm -hmm. now orthopedics is right there in the top three but anyway yeah. what made you decide Great. GI well, I, I, it's always kind of a multifaceted decision for me. There, there's a lot of reasons. But for one, I wanted to do something that was a specialty. So a big decision in medicine is whether you're going to do kind of like general medicine or general surgery and kind of do a little bit of everything. I wanted to do some sort of focusing in on something. And then GI appealed to me for a lot of reasons. One is that I really like the kind of the pathology and the physiology of the GI tract. I like the you know, the digestion, all the science associated with that, the liver. Um, but what's cool about GI is it's very diverse, even though it is a specialty. So you have the liver, you have the pancreas, you have the bile system, which most people don't even think of that when they think of GI, because you also have That's the right. intestines, the esophagus. So I like that element of it. I like that it's diverse in other ways and that you do procedures a lot, like you do colonoscopies, EGDs, but then you also have chronic medical care, like someone with Crohn's disease. You have to oh. change different medicines, monitor them for different deficiencies. You have to 
make sure they get screened appropriately for different things. Um, GI also has a lot of emergencies, but also it's not just emergencies because that would be too stressful for me. So it has <laughs> you know, office stuff that's boring and I like boring sometimes too. It's nice to have a, a mix of everything. And then the, the lifestyle is, is definitely appealing as well in the sense that it's not like a trauma surgeon where I, I mean, you do have call as a GI doctor, but overall there aren't nearly as many emergencies as like for a surgeon, for example. So you know, it's nice. You have that family life dynamic. I like the one video where you say something about the consult and he says, but it, it, it and they said, well, we're getting ready to close. And you said, it's 345. Yeah. yeah. We're closing. He's like, what? <laughs> you think, what medicine practice are you in that you get to close at 345 and go home? You know, <laughs> anyway, that's, that was a good one. Uh, yes. I, I was, I became more fascinated with that area of medicine once I burnt that little hole, <laughs> it was yeah. like, wow, you're more conscious of, of your digestive tract. And then it wasn't just a, a quick decision for me to decide to get uh, the sleeve procedure. And because I had, uh, obesity was not anything in my family or in my life until later in life. And, and I can have lots of reasons to blame on getting obese, but uh but still, I, I spent 10 years in that world, and, it, and I investigated it for probably 15 mm -hmm. before I said, okay, this is the route I'm going to go. And then, so you're really paying attention to your digestive tract when they're going to go and alter it. You know? oh, and so I, I really made sure that I had um, the, the pros and cons and knowledge before I, I chose to do that. Anyway, that that was, um, it, but but I get fascinated with disease process. Period. Mm -hmm. And when you come up with a little area that you, the little teaching point, which you've given me several today, is, uh -huh, I'm going to go investigate. Another thing in our world is the the coding and the billing and the auditing and and compliance. It, this is this is our world that um, you the disease process is what we have to learn but we don't get to go to to med school or spend all that time we but luckily providers love to educate too or tell you about their area i love your videos on poop <laughs> you know, and you know, fascinated with that uh, but we whether we specialize or not we have to understand all these areas how they work together no the signs and symptoms and the treatments. And so it's fun to get to have the ear of uh, a particular area. Any questions that we have coming in? I see lots of people that's in, but I don't know that they're going to have any questions for us. But know that you can also submit questions after the webinar and we will uh, uh, get you those answers trying to think if there's anything wrapping up that since I have you face to face that I could could ask you uh, about that won't run off in a tangent for a long time the other thing I thought of was scopes the because oh my we could scopes are not easy to code mm. uh, because it has to do with how far you get the intent you know, so let's say you start to scope somebody and for whatever reason, you know, and this was your intent to get to, to go up so far and, and you're not able to, maybe they're bleeding or uh, there's a mass or whatever, uh, you always code for the intent. And then you put a modifier on there that says, but we couldn't do this. Uh, right. That way you, you get paid for your intent with a discount. But for the scopes is you made a, a video that I, I thought, I didn't know that. I thought that when you scope someone that, uh, except, especially a lower, that you could go all the way up and you routinely went all the way up to the duodenum, all the way up. It, do you, but you alluded that, no, you don't. So I was, I was really shocked. Uh, and, but, I, but cause when you do an upper GI, you go, all the way to the duodenum and sometimes you peek in you know past the pyloric sphincter or whatever right you uh, but what's i guess my question is how come you don't just keep going 
<laughs> no, that's fair. Yeah, because with so with an EGD, we go down and through the esophagus, through the stomach, into the duodenum, and then that's usually as far as we go. We can go sometimes to the jejunum, which is the next part of the small intestine. Yeah. Um, but we definitely can't get through the whole jejunum because that's the jejunum is like twenty feet long. Right, um, exactly. And then with the colonoscopy, the other end, we we do the whole colon, and then we just barely peek into the end of the small intestine, which is the ileum. Right. So the the majority of the jejunum slash all of the jejunum and the beginning of the ileum are not seen on traditional scopes, and, and in some ways that's because of length of the scope. I, mean, I was just gonna say you, you don't have that much space to go as far as that is. <laughs> yeah, and then some of it is too. It's, it's just so much longer than people realize. Like the small intestine is like multiple meters long. So it's, as you go in further, the a common misconception when you're doing a scope, especially a colonoscopy, is it's not like you're just sticking a tube through a pipe and you're just going through and looking. The, the colon is very mobile. So when you're going in, you often get the colon, the tube, the scope itself, like loops on itself. So oh. it can be very challenging to get to the end of the colon, depending on uh, different factors. And very challenging is, is probably too strong of a word. For a beginning trainee like myself, it's very challenging yeah. because you're not, it's not just a fixed pipe that you're just passing through. So it's hard enough to get through the whole colon. So if going into the ileum and then trying to get all the way back up to the duodenum, for example, would be impossible from that perspective, too, because there's too many twists and turns. And okay, just that makes sense. To, to reach it. But yeah, from a physical distance perspective, the, the scope would have to be probably twice as long as it is now to even consider getting that far. Um, and then the other thing is just the amount of pressure that you'd have to exert on the lower parts of the GI tract. Like if you're doing a colonoscopy, it would get higher and higher as you're having to push and maneuver. And then the scope, once you get far enough in, doesn't respond to like you trying to twist things or turn knobs. And that makes sense. Be, unfortunately. But yeah, so there's, there's a few reasons, I guess. That makes say. sense. Before my husband's second career, he was a plumber. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Big correlation there, cleaning out lines. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, stealing with poop too. <laughs> exactly. That that makes sense. Okay, that when you said as soon as you 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 said that, I thought, well, of course, that yeah. would not make sense. Why you wouldn't do that? And then if there was a problem, ultimately you just you could open them up. But but I mean mm -hmm. that would be last resort and and oh, yeah. stuff. But. Um, very good. All right. That was fun. So we're almost at the end of the hour and uh, it says, is medical coding explained to physicians during their education? Yeah. Is it? Uh, that's a fair question. We don't get very much. I think it is definitely more focused these days, but that's not really saying much. It just went from zero to a tiny bit. I think um, what we get is a little bit of um, the kind of in clinic is mainly when we do it. it the inpatient side, we don't get uh, hardly any experience, but we do have our own kind of continuity clinic where our attendings are ultimately responsible for the billing, but they essentially let us practice and we kind of try to bill sometimes and they'll just change it um, according to their ways. The other thing that we get exposed to is at the VA, which obviously is a very different realm. Um, we do put in the diagnosis codes and those sorts of things, but they're, they're not like no one you know, the VA isn't as concerned with uh, money. So like if we don't put in the best codes, no one really comes back to us or like tells us you could have done this and this might've been a better reimbursement kind of thing. Cause it's, cause it's the VA. Yeah. Unfortunately, statistics get obscured that way. Don't they? You're always mm -hmm. like, Oh, we'll just say they got hepatitis. We don't care which one because it's mm -hmm. hepatitis. And <laughs> but we want to know um, that that's a good point. And like I said, my dream one of my dreams is to get in and do a few lectures, even if it's guest speaking or something to expose uh, mm -hmm. some of these uh, future providers and providers to, uh, to the code set and, and letting them know that it's based on statistics. Now, I know that we both talked about, we're both familiar with Epic. And one of the aspects that I've seen working with providers and Epic is that in the past, they wrote down the codes, they said what it was, and we looked at the documentation and we, or they, they didn't, they didn't deal with codes. They wrote what it was. We translated. That's what, you know, we're just translators. And uh, now with Epic though, and other EMRs, the providers are asked to pick the diagnosis. So it drops down and you say, okay, well, the person has GERD. All right. So you type in, you know, GERD and it brings up your codes. Okay, that's the, you know, and 
you get you are ultimately responsible for picking codes when you don't know the guidelines like mm -hmm. things like if a person has diabetes and you don't say whether they're type 1 or type 2 you default to type 2 because mm -hmm. like 98% of all patients have diabetes or type 2 you know yeah. and, and all these other little guidelines to say nope when you code this you have to have another code and mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately that's where education they're for you have to treat the patient manage the patient uh, as well as oh now i got to think of a code <laughs> yeah. well, but anyway uh, it's it, it's a fun world to be in because we get to read all the documentation we get to learn it's fascinating we get to see the treatments and and um and we don't have to smell the smells or yeah. touch patients or any of that other stuff it's and we don't have the student loans, <laughs> yes. but we're very thankful that you take up the challenge of going into this career. And um, so thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I have so many other things that I would love to talk to you about that would help us with education. And uh, now that I know how to get a hold of you, I will. <laughs> Uh, keep looking or having you do little videos and then we'll just put them out. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll link them out. Uh, go out and check out his YouTube channel and uh, also look at the Instagram and TikTok if you're not on there. And uh, again, make comments. That helps when you make comments on those as well as hit that little like button. Thank you very much, Doc Schmidt for joining us is a lot of it's been fun to pick your brain and uh, i if i had been writing well i i have a list of like five other things that i could think of that would be great lectures so we'll have to stay in contact All right. thank you very much guys i appreciate it bye do you need more medical certification and business training Learn more at www.cco.us.